Jesus gave us a responsibility that I don't suppose that many people do a whole lot of thinking about. But uh, he gave us his name and said, Now you use my name to get accomplished what needs to be done. And I'm giving you my power because all power is given to me. I'm giving you that all power. I'm taking the limitations off of you. If you, the qualification is faith. I will take the uh, limitations off of you. I said there's nothing too hard for God. Now I'm saying there's nothing too hard for you. He said nothing shall be impossible to you to believe. <clears throat> he also said that I want you to do the same thing I'm doing. And uh, he said, the works that I do shall you do, and greater works than these shall you do, because I'm going to the Father there in John chapter 14, 12. And then we have in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that we are commissioned in Christ's stead to take care of the situation here the needs of the people, whatever it may be. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 uh, <clears throat> tells us we're ambassadors. We're ambassadors for Christ. That means that we represent heaven. It has to be done right. Jesus had his followers to watch him. He wanted to show them what to do. Well, he looked at a fig tree one time and it didn't have the fruit on it. He cursed the thing. And they marveled at this and he said, well, I'm going to tell you what, not only can you speak to trees, but you can tell mountains to move out of the way and nothing shall be impossible to you. And whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast in the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but believe those things he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. He didn't say whatsoever he prayeth. He didn't say whatsoever he thinketh. He said whatever you're saying represents what you're doing. He talked to the wind. Well, he rebuked the disciples because he told them, take me to the other side. They couldn't do it. They had to say instead of doing what the Lord told them to do, they said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Isn't it strange? The opportunities the disciples had to exercise great faith with the master of the universe in the boat with them. Jesus calmed that storm. It wasn't too big for him. <clears throat> when the disciples had a failure in the fishing business, Jesus ordered the fish to surround that boat that they may catch fish. He wanted us to know that we still have the authority over the fish of the sea. And they said, well, you know, Master, we fished all night and <clears throat> really hadn't a whole lot happened. And, you know, we'll do what you say, but, you see, it's kind of a strange thing. And then they caught a lot of fish. And then Jesus did a very unusual thing. He had a fish to pay Peter and his taxes. Now, there's not anybody that I know of yet that could, uh, could go out and catch a fish and pay their taxes. But somehow Jesus is teaching us something that we're not particularly getting. And... Jesus walked on water, and Peter said, well, how about me doing it? Peter gets a lot of criticism because he began to sink. Well, I'll tell you what, he did something nobody else ever did that I know of. At least he walked on the water some, and that's something we haven't done. I haven't seen it in a way unless it was when the water was frozen. <clears throat> Jesus knew there was a need. They had a wedding and they ran out of wine. Why they ran out, I don't know if it's poor management or what. Thirsty people or what the case may have been. But Jesus saw the need. And he, he said, fill the water pots. 
Well, water pots is not wine. But at least the water turned into wine when they drew it out. There's at least one minister that had uh, had the privilege of seeing water turn to wine. And uh, <clears throat> I think that's quite interesting. We've seen oil multiplied. We've seen things multiplied in our circles. But I don't think we still got to what we need to get to. Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes. What is he trying to teach us? Listen, I'm giving you the instructions. This is the way I do it. This is the way you will do it. Well, but I'm not, I'm not Jesus. Well, I tell you, the Bible says Christ dwelleth in you. That means the anointing's there. Jesus stopped the funeral possession and walked up and told a fellow to get out of the casket. Now, he didn't do that to every casket coming down the road. But there was a case that he wanted to prove to his disciples that death has to give in. So he chose the most ridiculous circumstances. A man has been dead for a long time. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. He healed the sick. No matter what kind of sickness it was, if somebody exercised the faith, he got them healed. He cast out devils whether the devils liked it or not. He cleansed the leper. And one thing that a lot of people don't know, leprosy is not healed, it's cleansed. And now he says, now you go do likewise. I'm leaving. I am going to send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even a spirit of truth. So if you know the truth, that truth will make you free. <clears throat> what our problem mainly is that we're struggling because we're trying to do a spiritual thing with the carnal mind and it won't work. You cannot, you cannot reach God with the carnal mind. You reach God with a spiritual mind. You see, we have to have faith to reach God because without faith, it is impossible to please Him. We heard about it on Wednesday night. But at the same time, if you think about it, God has, faith is a spiritual thing, but He said God has dealt to every man a measure of faith so that everybody has an opportunity to take that seed and make it grow. Even an atheist could do that. That's the only way an atheist could get saved is that measure of faith that's given to him by God. <clears throat> now, here's the problem that happens. If we're going to be uh, in the carnal all the time, it says the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, you are not going to be able to do what you need to do if you're going to hang around the flesh in Galatians 5 and verse 17. <clears throat> and Romans 8, chapter 38, chapter 8, the 13th verse, it says, for uh, if we live in the flesh, you shall die, but if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. So the choice is living, dying, and all. When you understand that the church in general has so taught us that this passed away with the apostles, that passed away with the apostles, this is no longer valid, and the Lord didn't mean what he said, it's a strange thing, as, as great as God is, that he can't say what he means. <clears throat> the Bible tells us the sin shall have no dominion over you in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. And it tells us in Ephesians 5, 11, not to have anything to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. You can't live in two worlds. You're either going to be in the Spirit or you're going to be in the flesh. Now, one of the two. You can't serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24 says. You can't serve two masters. He said you either will hate the one and love the other, else you'll hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. <clears throat> but Jesus said the commandments of man and the doctrines of men and the traditions of man make the word of God of none effect. Tradition says... God may or may not heal you. The Bible says 
All the promises in him are yea and him amen, right? Tradition says God may do it and he may not. But the Bible says he will always do it. So uh, what we have to decide is who's right, the Bible or us. Now, listen, folks. You and I are going somewhere. You and I are in this world for a purpose. We're going somewhere. If you don't know where you're going, you can know where you're going. You're going to meet somebody along life's way that's going to need you. When I was in Pennsylvania, I told him, you be that man to fulfill that responsibility and duty. Somebody's going to need me. People say, well, the world can do without you. The world can do without me, but it'd be better for me to be here being in the will of God and doing what he said do. God may place in your path a lost soul that needs to find heaven. He may send in your path a person that desperately needs healing. I was at a place in the city. Chief sent word to me that his secretary is in a terrible condition. He made a man of God. This man is not a Christian, but he needs the man of God to come and pray for his secretary. <clears throat> well, I had no idea it would be that bad a deal, and I'll tell you, if I ever had shaken faith, I sure did that time. I'd seen a lot of miracles, but I was, I really struggled with that. But in the mighty hand of God, moved, and that woman was completely healed. God sent that woman in my path. What would you do if you were to face what Hogan's men faced? When what was it, 30, 30 how many people killed and dying? 12 killed, and how many was dying? <clears throat> Total of 39, I believe it was. He sent his men, well-trained men, out and said, all right, fellas, go out there. You've been taught how to do it. We're in terrible. There, those fellows out there are dead. At least or somewhere in the neighborhood of a dozen dead. Now, those of you which were here when Brother Hogan was here knows this guy's not lying, do you? But all the people except one raised from the dead. He don't know why that didn't come forth, but all of them raised from the dead and all the sick and broken heads and stuff was healed. What would you do if he would have sent you out there? Now, forget Hogan, when the Lord sends us out, he's going to do something, folks. You and I need the power of the Holy Ghost to do this work. There's people can say, well, I don't believe in that. Well, I tell you what, <clears throat> we've seen people get off their wheelchairs. We've seen some that didn't. There's one in here now that we're going to have to get off the wheelchair one of these days. I don't know who's going to get it done, <clears throat> but somebody has got to do something. Amen. Amen. We can't excuse ourselves. Listen, the church has been given power. If we stop analyzing each other and criticizing each other and finding fault with each other, in general Christendom, I think we'll have a lot more power. But at the same time, if God began to push the power up on us, could we handle the power? What would happen if you were really supernaturally empowered and something happened, somebody made you mad? Could you handle it? See, God can't give everybody power that is not led by the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> 
We're going to meet people that's bound by Satan. We've got to get them delivered. Some of you know it. One of our church services, a lady began to act up. I didn't know they'd brought her to get delivered. Well, anyway, she really took a fit. And I just stepped down from the platform, went down there and cast that thing out of her. She was free. You see, not all of them work quite like that. But the sick, what about the sick? Somebody's going to be in your path that's going to need you. And you're going to be somebody died prematurely that's going to need you. Strange thing as it is. What will you do with the needs of the world? Now I'd like for us to think with me a little bit here. We're talking about uh, living in the Spirit. Now what I want to talk to you about is <clears throat> how do we know that God wants us to do this? And furthermore, since so many people have been taught that these things passed away with the apostles and, and multitudes of other things, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, And all the promises of God are in him, yea, and in him, amen, to the glory of God by us, by us, by us. I want to ask you something. If God said all the promises of God are in him, yea, and in him, amen, I say yes, I say amen. And we say, but God didn't mean it, then we're saying God's either a liar or we're saying God doesn't have the capability of saying what he means to say. Oh, I wouldn't say that. You just did. Notice this. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. What does it say? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, but it's written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham, verse 14, might <clears throat> come on the Gentile. Let me ask you a question. Do you know where to find the curses in the Bible it's referring to? If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, and you want to know where that curse has been broken, go to Deuteronomy 28 and find your problem there. Then remind the Almighty God that he promised that Jesus broke that curse. Now it's up to me. The curse is broken, but it's still on me. The reason being because I'm carnal, sold under sin, I've got to get away from that carnal thinking and reasoning and deciding God doesn't mean what he says. That's the reason a lot of things don't happen anymore. Titus 1-2 says that uh, God cannot lie. God can't tell a lie. How do you like that? In fact, in Romans chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4, the fourth verse says, <clears throat> let God be true and every man a liar. So when you come up against somebody's religious theology, let God be true and every man a liar. Let your tradition idea go. Let it be a lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. God said, the words that go out of my mouth, they that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I pleased, please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. <clears throat> Isaiah 55 and verse 11. So he said, when that word is going out of my mouth, it's too late for you to say it won't work. It's up to you to take the word that I have said because my word is truth, John 17, 17. It says that you'll be sanctified through the word because the word is truth. What is going to concentrate us, separate us 
from the unbelieving crowd is because thy word is truth. John 17, 17. But what is truth? The word is truth. In John chapter 8, 32, most of y'all probably know this, it says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You will know the truth. If you don't know the truth, if somebody has messed you up, if somebody has taught you that this may happen, may not happen, it's going to be a problem. How can you believe God when some preacher tells you that God may and he may not. It is not God's fault. It never was God's fault. It can't be God's fault when we have a failure. It is because the carnal man has got in the way. If we would ever learn to really die, I mean, I'm talking about death. Die to self and give a life to Christ things in our life will take a big change. Tremendous change. Lots of changes. <clears throat> now, when you understand that I'm going to be free, if I know the truth, free from what? You're going to be free from everything that the Word says is against you. Sickness, diseases, poverty, anger, pride, self-consciousness, confusion, tumult, you name it. Fear and the, the works, jealousy and envy, spite and hate. The truth will make you free from all that. <clears throat> now, that's the introduction. I'll start with chapter er, number one now. This is the section that I've entitled The Promise of the Spirit. God knew we can't do all this stuff. We can't do it. Stuff is not a good word. We can't do these things without the Spirit. So God said, I'm sending the Spirit. I'm leaving. I am Emmanuel, God with us, but I am sending the Holy Spirit to you, and He will take over in your life. And you can be filled with Him. So it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to see that everything God promised us will be carried out if he can find the person to do it. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the very person that he's trying to get a hold of. The, the Holy Spirit will have the answers to your problems. There will not be any problem that the Holy Spirit has to scratch his head and say, sorry, I never heard of anything like that before. So he, he's not going to be surprised at what you face. He is there to make sure that when you pray, and you pray right, that your prayers are answered. He's there to make sure that he'll help you to pray because the Spirit helped with our infirmities. <clears throat> he is there to help your request to become realities. Jesus said, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened. But then he adds to that and says, Not only that, but he said, everyone that asketh receiveth. To him that seeketh, find. To him that knocketh, it'll be opened to him. Everybody. And if you really want the Holy Ghost, you're not going to get snakes and, and eggs and stuff. Uh, I mean, you're not going to get eggs and I'm, I'm still sitting wrong. Stones and snakes and scorpions. If you want the Holy Ghost, you get the Holy Ghost. But listen, folks, there is a warning that he says, try the spirits, because if you're fleshly, you'll get the wrong thing. Now, you will notice in the text that I had earlier here, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Law, law. Listen to this, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit 
The law of the spirit of life. There is a law that goes with the spirit of life. There is a spirit, a law that goes with the spirit of death. Have you ever thought about that God's got everything under law? We cannot seem to understand that because grace has been given to us, that there's still laws involved. Until the red light begins to flash behind you, there are blue lights here, I guess. <clears throat> and then you know that you're under arrest. And I've said it before, you grind down your window and say, I'm under grace, brother. There's laws that if you climb on top of the house roof, <clears throat> if you don't follow the law of carefulness, you could get hurt. So God said there's a law that you're going to follow whether you like it or not. It's either the law of life in Christ or the law of death. You do the choosing. There's a law that goes with the operation of the Spirit of God. There's certain things you can do, certain things you can't do. You need to know those laws. If those laws are broken, then chaos and confusion is going to come on the scene. <clears throat> The Lord said, I want you all to wait for the promise of the coming of the Spirit. And he said, you remember it's been said that John baptized with water, but I'm going to baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. So he tells them in Romans chapter 1, verse 8, not Romans, Acts, to wait for the, his coming. Then he assigns them to the prayer room in the upper room, and there they fasted and prayed. And just before he left the world, he did something very unusual. He went over and breathed on them. Wouldn't you think it would seem kind of strange? Somebody just went up and just went, <laughs> you know? And he said, receive you the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted, and whosoever sins you are retained, they are retained. Now, most people have not the slightest idea what that means. I've heard it explained like this. Whoever, uh, whoever sins are forgiven, you tell them they're forgiven. It's not at all what he meant. He said, I'm giving you authority to remit those sins out there. You speak to those sins. You take authority over those sins. And if you don't do it, they're going to be retained. So if you don't do your job, the sins are going to be retained. Now he says, I'm going to send unto you the Comforter. John 15, 26. And he said, even the Spirit of truth, I'm going to send him to you because you're going to have to have him. Because the truth in God's word and the spirit of truth will always agree. You will have to have the spirit of truth. Then he says in John 16 and verse 8 that when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin. So he's going to help you be a soul winner. He's going to help to reprove the world of sin. He's going to bring conviction upon people. <clears throat> and then he says of sin, because they believe not on me, of righteousness, because they go to the Father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Hey, did you hear that? The prince of this world is judged, not going to be. He even went so far as saying, now listen, the Holy Ghost is going to be out working with you. You resist the devil, and he'll flee from you, James 4, 7. Never give place to the devil in Ephesians chapter 4, 27. And uh, let's see, uh, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Uh, no, I don't say that well, they've got to start at verse 8 to get this thing. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 
Don't let him devour you. Whom resist steadfast in your faith. Jesus said, I want you to get this. He said, I want you to really get this thing now. The, it, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you can have life and have it more abundantly. <clears throat> this is what I want you to understand. Nobody can pluck you out of my hands. You keep that faith in there, keep resisting the devil, you keep going. The devil's works has been destroyed. You know, that's in Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians. Well, I'll get it right in a moment. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 is where that's found. The Bible says try the spirits because some things are going to look like the move of the Holy Ghost. Some things are going to look mighty close to it. See, folks, if it wasn't for the real, there wouldn't be no counterfeits. <clears throat> You've heard it said before that nobody counterfeits a $3 bill. There's a reason why they don't. <clears throat> I mean, you wouldn't expect to counterfeit something that don't exist. So that's the first thing to know, that something good is out there for us that Satan's trying to counterfeit to get our attention off of it. So the church will sit here and say, now looky there. I told you those fellows, well, they tell me that guy out there t speaks in tongues. Why, well, you know what? He does, that man does this, he does that, he does something else. And he got the whole world in the church messed up. Somebody said, yeah, I know people are getting healed today, but they're getting healed by the devil. How would you like to meet God that way? And the Almighty God says, hey, I heard you say when you was down on the earth that the devil healed those people. I happen to know who healed them. It was the Holy Ghost. And you're going to have to give an account of that. What you got to say here? Well, my preacher said that. Where's your preacher? Bring him up here. Yeah. The preacher's going to stand up there the same as you are. He, it's one by one. What are you going to do if he says to you, I told you there's a job to do. Did you do it? No, I didn't because. You know, folks, there's so many counterfeits out there, I decided not to do it. I'm not going to get involved because there's so many counterfeits, and furthermore, there's so many people talking against it, I'm not going to get involved. I had one talent, and sorry, Lord, I hid it. I buried it in a napkin. Take it away from him. Give it to him that's got the ten. Oh, but uh, is God going to hold me to it? He will. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We know it. You can know what's the difference. A spiritual-minded person can always find out what's spirit and what isn't. What's wrong? What isn't wrong? You have the spirit of the living God in you. Something will click and say, wait a little, am I really spirit-filled? Oh, yes, I am. Sure am. Well, then hereby you'll know the spirit of error and the spirit of righteousness. If there wasn't a possibility for a person to get involved in the wrong spirit, he wouldn't have told us to be careful for it, right? <clears throat> Now here's what it says in John 16, 13. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. It doesn't matter what mama thinks. It doesn't matter what granddad's got to say. Have you ever heard such a mess in your life as a woman and they're trying to get a life support machine or whatever it is, a feeding thing off of her, and the whole world is just about uh, expressing their opinion. See, the news media makes big money off of that kind of stuff. Well, there's probably been 10,000 people had that happen, and the news media didn't get involved. They didn't get the president involved. <clears throat> 
See, none of us is going to get that poplar because <clears throat> I had a birthday just recently and they didn't close the post office down for me. <clears throat> People still went to work. I guess you probably knew that. Listen, those who boast of being Pentecostal, let me ask you a question. Can you prove it? Those who boast to be word people, can you prove it? Yes. Suppose somebody comes in here and said, y'all believe... In healing? Yeah. Well, I brought somebody that I want you to heal. <clears throat> There's a fellow in, in uh, Australia. It, it really tickled me about him. He, he goes down there in that heathen country, and he tells people, Jesus is real. You need Jesus. And uh, he goes into this city quite a number of times and tries to preach to them about Jesus. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus did this. Jesus did that. Jesus did something else. There's a fellow come down and got him and he said, Hey, come here. <clears throat> Took him back. In through a bunch of houses and took him back there and he said, I'm going to tell you what. You're either going to get this person healed or we're going to kill you. Because you're lying to us. If you can't get that person healed, you're not serving the God you're claiming to heal. I mean serve. Yeah. Oh, he could have just said, well, hallelujah, this good opportunity. He told me I was so scared I didn't know what to do. He said, I've never prayed for the sick. <clears throat> we never prayed for the sick because it all passed away with the apostles. And now I'm on a challenge. He said, I went over and I laid my hand on that person and said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you to be healed. And the fellow was healed. He got out of town now. <laughs> and he wasn't going back to that town because he figured the whole town was going to get on him. He was sent a message, come back to this town. He goes to that town. <clears throat> and they told him, we got a bunch of sick here we want healed. He went down through, and everybody in that city gave their heart to the Lord. He said everybody, it wasn't a one person that was big enough to make a decision, didn't give their heart to the Lord. The next city found out about it and said, come to our city and do that. When he was with Esther and I, uh, him and his wife, I think he said there's five cities already that all of them are Christian. Because somebody dared to do something. <clears throat> How would you like to have that happen to you? Now, they go in the upper room. All the promises have been given. They're up in the upper room now. And they're praying. I don't suppose all of them stuck in there because... It wasn't 120, I don't think, there when the day of Pentecost came, but it finally came. <clears throat> they knew what Joel said, that the day would come when the Spirit of the Lord would be poured out. They knew that. But when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one place, and guess what happened? The Spirit of God came. And then they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And he said, I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. 
He didn't say he's going to pour it out on the spirit. He said I'm going to pour it out on the flesh. You know why? He's going to get rid of that flesh. He's going to burn that flesh up. That it's ineffective. And then once the flesh is burned up, the spirit can enter. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, we got people to make a big deal out of that. I'm not making a big deal out of that. All I'm telling you, they got the Holy Ghost. Now, just two chapters later, <clears throat> they were threatened and said, don't you preach anymore in the name of Jesus. You're going to stop that. We don't like these signs and wonders happening. But you see, in Mark 16, it says, and they went forth and the signs was following them. The signs followed them. And it says, and when they had prayed and said, Lord, behold our threatens and grant to thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they spake the word of God with boldness. And all of them was filled with the Holy Ghost. A new powerful anointing of God. So powerful, <clears throat> an Ananias and Sapphira shows up on the scene. And Peter, the, Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said, Ananias, did you sell that land for so much? Yes, for so much. You're a dead man. Boom, down he goes. People tell you that Elijah, I mean, Elisha made a mistake when he turned around and cursed those children. The Bible doesn't say God got after him for that. I'm not recommending doing that, but I'll tell you, Peter did the same thing here. He said, you're a dead man. And then comes in <clears throat> Mrs. Ananias a long time later. Listen, they had long church services. I mean, she came in several hours later. And, and Mrs. Ananias come in and said, Hey, hey, did you, Sapphira, did you sell the land for so much? Yes, for so much. How is it that you all agreed together to lie to the Holy Ghost? Those who buried your husband will bury you. They didn't even call her and say, Hey, your husband died. I mean, that's kind of unusual. They're so busy, they probably forgot it. These fellas just go out and bury him. <clears throat> well, I, I tell you what, I'm just wondering. With that kind of power, it scared them up, and it says uh, that they got all filled with the Holy Ghost and behaved themselves, too. Nobody else durst drone themselves, them fellas, because, I mean, Dave, you're not living real, you're not going to get involved in this church, see? And then Paul, which his name was Saul at the time, was driving down the road. Boy, I'm going to kill them Christians. I'm going to do away with them. But wait a little, the Holy Ghost is on the earth now. The Holy Ghost can arrest people. The Holy Ghost can change things around. So he's going down and Boy, ferocious. I mean, breathing out slaughter against the people of God and so forth. The Bible uses that expression. Uh, and here he comes down through there and, and all of a sudden he's knocked off his horse and Paul's riding a horse, not a donkey. Pretty expensive sort of a fella. That's the same as driving a Lincoln Continental. <clears throat> comes down through there and got knocked off and he said, the Lord spoke out of heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And Paul said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, who you persecute. Oh, I didn't persecute you, Lord. If you touch one of my people, 
you touch me. You've been doing damage. You're touching me. Now, Ananias, another Ananias. Lord said to him, Ananias? Yeah. There's a fellow down here, <clears throat> Saul of Tarsus. I want you to go down there. And I want you to fill him with the Holy Ghost. I can imagine this fellow thinking this thing. Who? The man, you mean to tell me that fellow? Why, Lord, I've heard many things. Oh, that's the way the church deals with people. Oh, I've heard many things. You know what old John used to do? Doesn't matter what John used to do. Doesn't make a difference at all, does it, John? Yep. See, John's a new John. <laughs> you know what? Ananias walks down there, and there sits Paul, Saul. He goes change his name to Paul, and he says, Saul, brother Saul. <laughs> brother Saul. He's not a Christian yet. He's a brother. Mm. So the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, now he ought to prove himself first before you fill him with the Holy Ghost. No, the Holy Ghost is there waiting on you. <clears throat> The Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. <clears throat> you know what? Saul gets off from that place. His name is changed to Paul, and you can read his word. He's got the Bible where he says, you follow what I'm telling you to do. Now, people want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. What do you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost for? It might be a good idea to check it out sometime. What do you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost for? What is the real purpose of it? Well, I want that tingling. Oh, touch electric fence or you'll get that. That's all you want. But I want, I, I want to be seen. See, what I want to do is I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost and operate in those gifts, and everybody will recognize me as being a great child of God. Oh, is that what you want to be filled for? What do you really want to be filled for? Well, I'll tell you what. The reason I want to be filled because it says that... And it shall come to pass in that day that the, his burden shall be taken off of thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. And uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 10, 27, I want the anointing so the people can be delivered from their yokes, including me. Now the, the Spirit has been limited if you have a King James Version, I want you to look up John chapter 3, verse 34. John, uh, James, <laughs> Lord help me not to make these mistakes. John chapter 3, verse 34. I thought I was over this mistake business. I am, starting now. <laughs> Calling those things be not as though they were. <clears throat> All right, now, if your Bible is a King James, it reads like this. For he whom God has sent speaketh the word of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Does your Bible have italics where it says unto him? All right, that means it was not in the original. Why did they say 
unto him when the Bible didn't say unto him. I want to tell you, folks, I'm not the one to criticize Bibles and tear them to pieces and say that it would be better translated, but somebody shouldn't have put that unto him there. This is what it should read. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure, period. God doesn't give the Spirit by measure. You decide the fullness. He talks about being filled with the Holy Ghost. What do you mean? Limited. No, he doesn't give it limitation. You open yourself up and he'll pour you out more blessing and more power all the time. All right, now these fellows, are, uh, they're following Jesus and they're watching Jesus. And Jesus tells them, all right, now you go out and do what I've been doing. While Jesus was still on the earth, he sent them out to do some of the things. Well, they ran across the fellow that they couldn't handle. <clears throat> so they said to Jesus, we couldn't cast him out. Why couldn't we cast that lunatic boy's demon out of him? He said, because of your unbelief. Hmm. See, Jesus said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you should say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Folks, somewhere we need a revival in getting what belongs to us. When Jesus, or when the Holy, when the angel spoke to Mary, I'm still improving, <clears throat> spoke to Mary, he said, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Mary, it's not going to be impossible for the Holy Ghost to come upon you and impregnate you. It's going to happen. And Mary said, let it be, be according to your word. See, what the story is, folks, the Lord said, I'm torn into you, so you pour out. I'm pouring into you, so you pour out. In the last day, Jesus cried out, in the last day of that great feast, and stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. How you like that? All right, now what are you going to do with that rivers of living waters? What are you going to do with it? That's a very important thing, what you're going to do with the power that God has given you. <clears throat> now, if you really want to know if you can operate and function in the spirit of the living God to the fullest extent, all right, now uh, let's look at this, checks, uh, this checklist. All right, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and I want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. So we go to the checklist. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-serving, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now, what I want to ask you, can you say that I'm filled with the Holy Ghost so I can check that I have love in my heart? Real love everybody. I love my neighbor. Joy, the joy of the Holy Ghost is in me. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, is in me. I am long-suffering, yes, even when it's hard, I'm long-suffering. Are you gentle? Yes. Goodness? Yes. Do you have faith? I think so. How about meekness? I'm mm, not sure about that. What do you reckon happens now? See, we place a limitation on us when there's something in our life goes wrong. Now let's look over here on this other side and let's look at the checklist here. 
All right, I wouldn't commit adultery, absolutely not. Fornication, no, no way, no way. What about uncleanness? Now, that's impurity, but it also has to do with just being dirty. See, here's the thing that happens. A lot of people want to live with a low-class lifestyle and live in a high-class way. So when they do that, what they're going to do is take advantage of you. They want to live low class, but they want you to help them to live high class, so they're going to take advantage of you. They won't pay their bills, and they want you to pay them for them. That's the way it works. Because they're trying to live above their corrupt lifestyle. Lasciviousness, which is filthiness. What about the jokes you tell? Oh, you know, are the jokes real clean? Adultery, I mean, is it anything between you and God? Witchcraft? Well, that pharmaceutical thing, you're taking a lot of dope in you. Hatred, variance, contention, and immolation, which is jealousy, wrath, which is indignation, strife. Well, what about strife in your home? What about strife in your marriage? What about strife in your family? Now, you want to go out and you want to be empowered of the Holy Ghost to do everything. But what about seditions, division? What about heresy, envyings, murders, drunkenness, and writing and so forth like this? What are we talking about? I want to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. <clears throat> I want the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the word of faith, and, and all these to operate in me. Could you check them off? Now let me show you something <clears throat> that's very important. If you're going to want to operate in the fullness of the Spirit of the living God, <clears throat> look at this. The fruit of the Spirit is needed. The word of wisdom, the word of uh, knowledge, faith, the gift of healing and so forth is all needed. All that's needed. If you're going to do the work of the Lord, you're going to need them. If you're going to run a business, you're going to need them. If you go to a job, <clears throat> you're going to need them. If you run an automobile, you definitely need them. <laughs> so you'll notice that faith shows up both in the, the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Faith. And everybody's given a measure of faith, you see. Now, let me, uh, let me explain something to you. If you can't check yes to uh, the left-hand side, you're going to have a problem with the right-hand side. In other words, if you have a problem with love, you're going to run into the problem over here on the right-hand side. Because even faith, it says, faith worketh by love there in Galatians 5, 6. <clears throat> See, the problem is that we, we have problems <clears throat> with our flesh, but we want the gifts of the Spirit in operation. And what's going to happen? When that carnality is in your church, you're going to have witchcraft. That's what it's going to end up to be, is witchcraft. There's a problem with the fruit of the Spirit. There will be a problem with the gifts of the Spirit. I've seen more misuse and abuse of that. People running around, jumping over benches and everything else. You need more than jumping over benches, folks. <clears throat> See, faith worketh by love. It talks about joy in the Holy Ghost. It talks about uh, now, watch here in Hebrews chapter 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. The Holy Spirit is holy. So if, if the Holy Spirit is holy, we're going to have to be holy, aren't we? The Bible says the Holy Spirit is given to those that obey him. In Acts chapter 5, 32, 
Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. I want to ask you today, do you really understand how valuable and important it is for you to have the Spirit your things in your life, because as we go through this, we're going to come into some pretty tight, tough stuff here after a while, getting us ready to face a world, face those challenges, face that which is out there in the future. We've got to do it. Love, joy, and peace is the first things mentioned under the fruit of the Spirit, and they are spiritual things. Love is spiritual. Joy is spiritual. Peace is spiritual. If it's carnal, it'll go down. It won't work. That's why people get married with carnal love, and it's gone. <clears throat> My wife and I have been married a long time, and we still love each other, don't we, dear one? At least in the public we do. <laughs> No, we live like that at home, too. But you see, love, joy, and peace are spiritual forces and function only with giving and receiving the same. You have to not only receive love, you have to give it. You don't just receive joy, you give it. That's what makes it work, is the receiving and giving. When you receive the Holy Ghost, the whole purpose is that you give it out. It's not, you will get benefits from it, but that's not what you're in it for. It's a spiritual force that's going to govern your whole life. Joy, love, joy, and peace. That's going to govern your whole life. <clears throat> Natural love, joy, and peace is carnal, and therefore it strives against the spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Why? Because he's spiritually discerned. That's what it says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14. <clears throat> How do I know that I'm on the right road? It says, because he's given me his spirit. I have the spirit of God working in me. How do I know if I've got the spirit of God? Go to the checklist. If you need to work on it, checklist. Find out. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. Check it. Find out where you're at. <clears throat> I'm going to give you, Jesus said in John 14, 16, I'm going to give you the spirit of truth. The world can't receive it. They can't receive it, but you can. But the comforter, John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father shall send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. far better than this I'm homesick for heaven where loved ones have gone who are safe in his wonderful care if we could but hear from our loved ones so dear they all say they